thank you, uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, and thanks for those of you who were able to get here early uh, to see the Treasury Secretary. Uh, we have a huge day on tap, and we want to make it as interactive as possible. For those of you who've been coming to this conference over the past years, we thank you. Um, it has been a, a remarkable uh, ride for us to do these every year. And this year in particular, we are, as I said, uh, with the Treasury Secretary, uh, it is very special to be uh, in this particular location today. Um, let me just give you a little bit of a preview of what we've got on tap for the rest of the day. Uh, and then I'm going to bring out uh, Mary Jo White, who's going to uh, be doing our keynote uh, speech today. Um, after uh, we hear from the chair of the SEC, the lineup, I think, just keeps getting better and better and better. We have Lloyd Blankfein, who we can talk to about all things uh, markets and what's going on with the economy. And, uh, I want to get uh, everyone in the, in the audience an opportunity to get a shot on goal and ask a question if they can. Mary Barra is going to be here, uh, CEO of General Motors. She, of course, has had a very quiet year uh, in her first uh, year out uh, running that company. Uh, Ray Dalio is going to be here. He is, uh, of course, runs uh, Bridgewater, the largest uh, hedge fund in the world, $130 billion. Then Jeff Bukas, the CEO of Time Warner, uh, is here. He, asks, he hasn't been in the news either, uh, so we'll uh, ask him. Uh, what he's uh, thinking about. Uh, we have a fun little treat after lunch. Will Shorts, for those of you who are crossword puzzle lovers, is going to be here and he's going to do something very special with all of us. Um, then we have the CEO of Jawbone is going to be here. I wear one of these uh, Jawbone things on my wrist to figure out how much, uh, how far I'm going to be walking and what I'm doing. So we're going to talk about wearables, uh, Apple, the Apple Watch, what all of that means and how it may change all of our lives. Uh, Paul Singer is going to be here. We'll talk about activism. Uh, and uh, maybe a little bit about Argentine bonds and what all of that means. Uh, then John Herring is here. We're going to talk about cybersecurity. Uh, this guy is a white hat hacker. He can literally hack every single person's phone in this room, I promise you. Um, and maybe he can even do a demo on stage. Uh, Larry Fink is going to be here from BlackRock. Uh, then we have Jessica Alba and uh, Brian Lee. We think of Jessica Alba oftentimes as an actress, but she now runs a company that is worth a billion dollars, and we'll talk about how that happened. Uh, Tony Schwartz is here from the Energy Project, also writes for Dealbook, and we're very excited to hear. He is my um, productivity guru of sorts, and um, I think can help everybody here uh, try to stretch uh, 60 seconds of a minute into a, just a tiny bit longer. Uh, Stephen Schwartzman from Blackstone will be here. Then Ken Chenault, who uh, makes only a couple of rare interviews a year uh, from American Express. We'll talk about the future of uh, payments, Apple Pay, Bitcoin, and all sorts of other issues, and service, customer service. Uh, and finally, uh, Adam Silver, the chairman, uh, uh, the commissioner, rather, uh, of the NBA. And there is so much to talk about with him. So with that, that is the day. I hope you uh, all stick around throughout the day. Uh, let me do this, though, now, which is to introduce somebody uh, who we're thrilled to have here uh, this morning, Mary Jo White, uh, our keynote uh, speaker. She is uh, the first woman to be named the chair of the SEC. Uh, before being confirmed as chair, she led a litigation team at Dev Voice in Plimpton. Uh, she made her name, of course, as U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, where her offices, and I want to mention this, uh, earned convictions against terrorists responsible for the 1993 bombings of the World Trade Center. Uh, with that, the chair of the SEC, Mary Jo White. Mary. Music's perfect. I'm, I'm told they did that for me. So I, ho I hope it, uh, they did it for all of us. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for that uh, introduction and for the invitation uh, to be uh, with you today. I'll say on a personal note, it's particularly meaningful uh, to me to be speaking for the first time in this building. Uh, the SEC, which I have now chaired for 18 months, has many important priorities for the upcoming year. These include addressing structural questions about our complex dispersed securities marketplace, reviewing our public company disclosure regime uh, to make it more effective for investors, and completing the rulemakings mandated by Congress under the Dodd-Frank and Jobs Acts, just to name really a very few. But what I've chosen to focus on here is our regulation of the asset management industry, which is one of the agency's most important responsibilities. As many of you know, the SEC has regulated asset management since the passage of the Investment Advisors Act and the Investment Company Act in 1940. 
nearly 75 years ago. And our objective in discharging this responsibility is guided by our overarching mission to protect investors, to maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation. Over the years, our regulatory program for asset management has grown and adapted, guided by our mission to address ever-evolving markets and the changes that evolution presents. We are now embarking on a new period of regulatory change, driven by long-term trends in the industry and the lessons of the financial crisis. This morning, uh, I will talk about the SEC's pr perspective on the asset management industry today through a review of some of its most important features, highlighting the regulatory issues that the industry presents, and setting out how we plan at the SEC to enhance and strengthen our response to those issues. Currently, there are more than $63 trillion of assets under management in what has become a vital part of our economy, with over 11,000 investment advisors and almost 10,000 mutual funds registered with the SEC. This in industry has grown exponentially from the $4 billion in assets and 51 firms Congress identified in 1940 that managed, supervised, and gave investment advice with respect to funds. And the industry continues to grow, with the assets under management for most of the largest firms uh, doubling since 2004. Investors and retail investors in particular have increasingly come to rely on advice from investment advisors and investments in mutual funds to meet their financial needs. In 2013, 57 million households, or 46% of all U.S. households, owned mutual funds. American households invest in mutual funds and hope their investments will grow for many important reasons, including making a down payment on a house, saving for a college education, and ultimately providing income for retirement. The industry has also created new products and implemented new investment strategies to meet a range of demands, new demands, from an increasingly diverse population of investors. Exchange-traded funds, for example, emerged in the early 1990s and have grown significantly since then. In October 2014, trading in U.S.-listed ETFs and other exchange-traded products made up about a quarter of U.S. equity trading by dollar volume. Private funds have also grown significantly in number and size, and many mutual funds are now engaging in alternative investment strategies and using derivatives. Evolution of the asset management industry with new risks and challenges is not a surprising phenomenon. Over the years, the Commission and its staff have taken important steps to recalibrate its program to better match the current facts on the ground. Understanding the tools that the Investment Company Act and Investment Advisors Act give us to regulate asset management helps to illuminate this ongoing process. These statutes establish a comprehensive federal regulatory framework that addresses a wide range of activities and focuses on many complex areas of regulation. You know, three of the most significant tools provided are controls on conflicts of interest, a registration, reporting, and disclosure regime, and controls on fund portfolio composition risks and operational risks. Now, I recognize that I'm drawing very general lines to organize very complex issues here, but looking at these tools is important to understand the approach the SEC is taking to respond to the evolution of the asset management industry. Let me take these tools in turn. Uh, starting with controls on conflicts of interest. The statutory framework establishes regulatory safeguards and incentives to address risks to investors emerging from the conflicts of interest existing in the organization, operation, and management of investment advisors and funds. You know, even reviewing just the last 15 years of commission regulation demonstrates our careful focus on revising the approach to conflicts of interest to address modern market practices. For example, in 2003, the Commission required advisors and funds to implement written compliance programs and appoint chief compliance officers to address, among other things, abusive market timing practices that benefited some investors at the expense of others. And in 2010, the Commission amended advisors' disclosure brochures to more clearly explain conflicts of interest to their clients. Second set of tools is our registration, reporting, and disclosure regime. Now, obviously, registration is the core regulatory foundation 
that enables the Commission to identify, monitor, and regulate funds and advisors. The periodic reporting and public disclosure of their key business arrangements, related conflicts, and compliance practices is critical for oversight. Here, too, the Commission has taken significant steps. Most recently, using authority granted under the Dodd-Frank Act, we implemented a comprehensive registration regime for investment advisors to certain private funds. These rules use the framework laid out 75 years ago to address the much larger role that private fund advisors have come to play. The Commission also created a summary prospectus to better focus mutual fund investors on their fees and risks of a fund. Now, the importance and impact of conflict of interest controls and the registration and reporting requirements are indisputable. But my main focus today is really on the third set of tools, controls on portfolio composition risks and operational risks. Now, by portfolio composi composition risk, I mean the risk related to the mix of a fund's investments <coughs> and the impact that mix, including the interaction of particular financial instruments, can have on a fund. Portfolio composition risks can include risk associated with the liquidity and leverage of a fund's holdings. And by operational risk, I generally mean risk from inadequate or failed internal processes and systems. Now, just as they do for conflicts of interest and registration, our governing statutes set forth a framework for addressing these issues. That is why mutual funds and investment advisors have limits on where to custody their assets and on what terms. Capital structure restrictions limit leverage and protect a, re a registered investment company's assets and investors from the risks associated with excessive borrowing or overexposure to indebtedness, the requirements for certain funds to diversify holdings, and of course, mutual funds must pay shareholders their redemption proceeds within seven days of any request. Now, the Commission has regularly sought to evaluate and enhance its regulations to address portfolio composition and operational risks. Most recently, the Commission approved major reforms to money market funds that demand significant new controls to address the risk those funds present to investors and potentially the larger financial system. Working with our fellow regulators, the Commission has also established reporting requirements for advisors to private funds that includes important information about certain private fund activities. With respect to operational risk, the Commission has implemented a number of rules to protect customer information, including most recently in 2013, rules to address the risk of identity theft. Now, while these actions are all important, there is still work to be done. The financial crisis only underscored the importance of the careful management of risk by funds and their advisors, including portfolio composition and operational risks in particular. The Commission staff has been focused on such risks for some time and has expanded and deepened its oversight of the industry, which enables us to better identify, monitor, and evaluate these risks in order to facilitate appropriate Commission responses. It is not enough, however, to simply identify, monitor, and evaluate. A broader set of proactive initiatives is required to help ensure that our regulatory program is fully addressing the increasingly complex portfolio composition and operations of today's asset management industry. And the staff at my direction has been developing recommendations for three core initiatives. This is the right set of initiatives for this stage of the development of the modern asset management industry. First, we must improve the data and other information we use to draw conclusions about the risks of the asset management industry and develop appropriate regulatory responses. Existing data requirements need to be expanded and updated. Second, we must take steps to ensure that registered funds enhance their fund level controls so that they are able to identify and address risks related to the composition of modern, modern portfolios whether those spring from the overall financial profile of a fund, such as its liquidity levels, or the nature of specific instruments, such as derivatives. And third, we must take steps to ensure that firms have a plan for transitioning their clients' assets when circumstances warrant. If we have learned nothing else from the financial crisis, it is that we must test and plan for the worst. Let me begin with data. 
the SEC's ability to effectively identify and address risks in their asset management industry is diminished without the ability to monitor for those risks at the fund level and across the entire industry. While funds and advisors currently report significant information about their portfolios and operations to the Commission, these reporting obligations have not, in my view, adequately kept pace with emerging products and strategies being used in the asset management industry. For example, our rules do not require standardized reporting for many types of derivatives used by funds today. This is a clear gap, particularly given the growth in the volume and complexity of derivatives used by funds. Similarly, we do not today receive the most complete information about securities lending by funds, which is done by approximately a quarter of funds. The staff is developing recommendations for the Commission to modernize and enhance reporting for both funds and advisors. You know, even the reporting of basic census information should be updated so that we are better able to monitor industry developments and potential compliance issues. Beyond that, the reporting and disclosure of fund investments in derivatives, the liquidity and valuation of their holdings, and their securities lending practices should all be significantly enhanced. Collecting more data on separately managed accounts where the advisor manages assets owned by a particular client will also better inform examination priorities and the assessments of the risks associated with those accounts, which are a significant portion of the business of many investment advisors. We also need to ensure that registered funds have controls in place that effectively identify and manage the risks of their current portfolio composition. Liquidity management and the use of derivatives in mutual funds and ETFs are two key areas of focus by the SEC staff. Inadequate controls in these areas can create significant risks for funds themselves and their investors, as well as raising questions about whether there could be a potential impact on the financial system as a whole. Liquidity risks affect investors in open-end investment companies and ETFs through the underlying assets in which those funds invest. A fund that does not manage liquidity risk in its portfolio could have difficulty meeting redemptions if it came under stress, particularly an open-end investment company which has to provide shareholders with redemption proceeds within seven days of any redemption request. And stress at funds facing increased redemptions could in turn potentially have spillover effects in the markets in which those funds invest. If a distressed fund, for example, has to sell securities at below market prices to meet redemptions, it could drive down asset prices for funds and other investors holding those securities or similar assets. Derivatives can, propose, can pose a separate set of risks. The use of derivatives by registered funds has grown significantly in recent years, and many are using derivatives in increasingly complex ways. While funds often use derivatives to manage risks or to more efficiently adjust exposure to market, sector, or security, these instruments also frequently result in leveraged investment exposures and potential future obligations that can create risks for the funds. A more comprehensive approach is required to address the risks associated with the increasingly diverse nature of fund holdings and the use of derivatives. The Commission staff, both in investment management and our national exam program, have been focused on these issues for some time and the results of these efforts are informing recommendations for the rulemaking in these areas. Now, at the most basic level, the staff is considering whether broad risk management programs should be required for mutual funds and ETFs to address the risks related to their liquidity and use of derivatives, as well as measures to ensure the Commission's comprehensive oversight of those programs. The staff is also reviewing options for specific requirements, such as updated liquidity standards, disclosures of liquidity risks, or measures to appropriately limit the leverage created by a fund's use of derivatives. Such changes could better protect investors, provide better transparency about the liquidity risks associated with various funds, and mitigate any broader implications where funds forced to sell assets precipitously to meet redemptions. A third focus of our regulatory enhancements is on the impact on investors of a market stress event or when an investment advisor is no longer to serve its clients. There are several risks associated with such events. For example, during an advisor's dissolution or following the departure of key personnel, 
an advisor may face challenges in serving its client's needs while also swiftly transferring its asset management services to another firm. To better understand this risk, it is important to recognize that the risks associated with winding down an investment advisor are different than those associated with other kinds of financial firms. Client assets are not the assets of an advisor, and advisors routinely exit the market without significant market impact. Those exits, however, are not without challenges, and those challenges may differ depending on the advisor's clients. For example, if there are restrictions on investors' ability to access or move assets away from an advisor, or more generally, de facto limitations imposed by illiquid assets or market conditions, a clear transition plan for that advisor could benefit investors and the market. The staff is therefore developing a recommendation to require investment advisors to create transition plans to prepare for a major disruption in their business. The process of creating such a plan in advance of an actual severe disruption in the advisor's operations could better prepare advisors and their clients to deal with the transition and its attendant risks if one were required. The staff is also considering ways to implement the new requirements for annual stress testing by large investment advisors and large funds as required by the Dodd-Frank Act. Stress testing is an important tool routinely used by banking regulators. Implementing this new mandate in asset management, while relatively novel, will help market participants and the Commission better understand the potential impact of stress events. Building on what we have learned about stress testing through money market fund reform, the staff is evaluating what protocols would be appropriate for investment advisors and investment companies. As with transition planning, the staff is considering how to tailor these requirements for asset management, as well as for different types of firms. Taken together, the recommendations I have just outlined will lay the foundation for a renewed focus on regulating risks arising from the portfolio composition and operations of investment advisors and funds. Now, before closing, I want to just change my lens a bit uh, and reflect very briefly on the Commission's role in addressing systemic risk, uh, which has obviously become part of the public dialogue about the regulation of asset management. The term systemic risk can mean different things to different speakers, and addressing the range of those meanings is well beyond the scope of my remarks today. But clearly, one of the most fundamental post-crisis changes for all of the financial regulators, including the Commission, has been an emphasis on addressing risks that could have a systemic impact on the securities markets or on the financial system as a whole. This renewed emphasis, in my view, complements our longstanding mission to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation. The program I've just outlined is designed to serve our historic three-part mission. But at the same time, the measures we take will necessarily have a broader impact on the financial system. Asset management is a significant segment of our financial system. And as we all know, the nature of finance means that changes to any significant segment has consequences for the others. Truly tackling systemic risk in any area obviously demands a broader program than one agency can execute. Systemic risks cannot be addressed alone. They are, after all, systemic. Risks that could cascade through our financial system could have an impact on a range of market participants, many of which we do not oversee at the SEC. The Financial Stability Oversight Council, FSOC, is an important forum for studying and identifying systemic risks across different markets and market participants. The market perspective that the SEC brings is an essential component of FSOC's efforts. And FSOC's current review of the potential risks to the stability of the U.S. financial system of asset managers is a complement to the work we are now undertaking at the Commission. You know, President Roosevelt rightly heralded the Investment Company Act and Investment Advisors Act as milestones in the vigorous program to protect the investor. To continue this vigorous program, the SEC must continue to focus on assessing the activities of the asset management industry as it evolves, ensuring that we are addressing the risks of modern portfolio composition and operations and anticipating and planning for the worst. Our objective, however, is not to eliminate all risk, far from it. 
Investment risk is inherent in our capital markets. It is the engine that gives life to new companies and provides opportunities for investors. Just as our regulatory program evolves, so too must our understanding of the balance that program strikes between reducing undue risks and preserving the principle of reward for risk that is at the center of our capital markets. You know, in all of these efforts, the details will matter a great deal, and there is significant work to do before we have final rules in place. We will be looking to investors and market participants to provide us their views, and I will be working very closely with my fellow commissioners to translate staff recommendations into commission action. While the SEC's regulation of asset management is strong and comprehensive, the source of that strength has been our willingness to take stock of our rules with a clear vision and implement the necessary changes to make effective regulation that fits current market realities. We've done that many times since 1940, and it is essential that we do so again in 2015. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Before, before you go, and I know we don't have time for questions, but I need to ask one while you're standing. You can Surely. sit if you want, but we can no, stand. No, no, stand, stand good. Um, it's because it's on the front page of our I think he's today. blocking my exit. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> so now we know that asset managers have to watch out. But uh, insider trading, it's on the front page of every paper yep. today. It is. There was a uh, major decision that was overturned that may rewrite the rules or at least redefine, uh, perhaps more narrowly, uh, how we think of insider trading and who is a tippy, if you will. And I don't think you've spoken yet on what the implications of that decision are may be, and so I wanted to get your So in view. front of my closest one million friends, uh, no, seriously, we, we're obviously, we're currently reviewing the decision. Uh, uh, we're in dialogue with the Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office about it. Uh, I, we have, uh, I think, look, there's no question it's a significant decision. And my uh, initial sense of it is that it took uh, the opinion and the decision, an overly narrow view of the insider trading law, and that is a concern. Uh, but we're continuing um, to review it, so. Okay. okay. Mary Thank Jo White, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.